Okay, so today we're going to start our uh, checking account uh, simulation, but we have to cover some groundwork before we do that. So I'm looking at page two. Why should I learn this? Aren't checking accounts obsolete anyway? A checking account is one of the safest and easiest ways to manage your money. It's a safe place to store your money, but the money is still very accessible, which means you can get to it very easily. The alternatives to a checking account are more expensive and or less safe. The deposit in a prepaid debit card or prepaid credit card is not insured by the U.S. government, so if you lose it, it's gone. Managing your checking account is easy, but mismanaging it can be very expensive and embarrassing. You will need a checking or savings account to get a credit card, um, except for prepaid credit cards. Some savings accounts allow transactions similar to checking accounts, but by law must limit the number of withdrawals and payments you can make to six per month, which is kind of a bummer. Some bills like utilities, insurance, taxes uh, cannot be paid via credit card. It's not a good idea to pay your bills by credit card anyway, um, unless you pay an added fee. And some local tax bills can only be paid by paper check or cash. A recent study shows that younger adults are more prone than any other age group to incur avoidable bank fees simply due to not managing their checking accounts. So that's why we're doing this. So you don't fall into that statistic. Uh, opening a checking account. When you open your first checking account, you will probably want to use a bank that is conveniently located. We would suggest that you go and talk to a banking officer about the various checking account features available and their costs. Initially, you will probably just need a low-cost account with few features. We very, very strongly recommend that you choose an insured financial institution. This will then guarantee in the event of a bank failure for any reason, you will get your money back. F FDIC insured, you probably have heard that before. That's what that means. Uh, opening your checking account will require personal identification, the address where you live, and a social security number. If you are under 18, the bank may also require that the account be jointly owned with an adult due to legal obligations involved in writing a check. One item you will have to provide while opening an account is your official signature. Your signature on checks you write effectively turns that piece of paper into money, and the bank will use the signature to provide to you provide when opening the account to verify your checks. Do not use a nickname. Think just a little before you sign the application since you will be signing all your checks and most other legal documents this way, probably forever. Your banker will give you an account number, some checks and deposit tickets with your account number pre-printed on them, and a check register to record both checks written and the amounts deposited. The banker can also arrange for you to receive a debit card to access ATM machines and use for purchases, plus additional checks. So now we're ready to go. A debit card looks like a credit card, but it's connected to your checking account. When you use your debit card to make a purchase, the money is immediately removed from your checking account. Even though a store has to pay a fee when you use your debit card, they may prefer it to a check since there is always a chance that your check may bounce. They know immediately when you use a debit card that you have money in it or not. They don't know that with a check necessarily. So now we're on page three, making deposits. You probably think of a checking account as a way to make payments. This is true, but you have to have money in the account before you can do that. So let's start with making deposits. You can deposit both cash and checks at your bank or at an ATM machine. Either of these may require you to fill out a deposit ticket. Exact style varies, but the information is relatively the same, like what you see there um, on page three. So S.H. Williams has filled out this deposit slip for $253.20. The deposit includes $20 cash, $20 bill, and a check for $233.20. The check is identified by listing the number, the check number, that appears in the upper left corner of the check, and they give you an example there. They show you the 7-10 as the check number, but it's typically written with the the number 347, which you see in the grayed out um, part of the check on the right side. That's usually what you would write instead of 7-10 under checks on the deposit ticket. 
So you may also be able to deposit a check by sending an image of the check to your bank via smartphone, smartphone or computer. The full amount of a check that you deposit may not be available for several days since your bank must determine that there are funds in the account of the person or company who wrote you the check. Endorsing a check. A paycheck or any other check that you receive must be endorsed by you before it can be cashed or deposited. You de endorse the check by signing it on the back. Simple. But there are a few rules. You need to sign the check in ink so that it cannot be erased. Your endorsement must be within one and a half inches of the trailing edge of the check, and they show you there in the example on page three. You must endorse the check with exactly the same name as appears on the front of the check. If a nickname was used or your name was misspelled on the front, endorse the check using that nickname or misspelling and then add your official signature below that. You should deposit the check shortly after you receive it. Banks typically will not accept a check six months after the date on the face of the check, but some checks will state that they become non-negotiable or can't be cashed at all after 45 or 60 days. Ironically, being able to deposit your check by smartphone or computer may make banks' enforcement of endorsement rules much more stringent because you still have the physical check and might accidentally try to deposit it a second time. So endorsement examples on page four. There are three common types of endorsements. The bank blank endorsement, which we recommend not using, the restrictive endorsement, and the endorsement in full, which you will rarely need. Remember that all endorsements must be done within one and a half inches of the trailing edge of the check. So the blank endorsement is the simplest, consisting of nothing more than your signature. It can be cashed by anyone who possesses it and should not be used if you plan to send the check through the mail. We recommend that you only use this when you are actually in the bank ready to make a deposit because if it's a blank endorsement and you lose the check, whoever finds it can cash it. A restrictive endorsement is much safer. A restrictive endorsement stating for deposit only means that the check must be deposited into your account. Because no one else can cash a check, you can mail it to your bank in complete safety. Restrictive endorsements may be required for, mo for mobile deposits. For a little added security, you may also want to add a line with your bank account number. Your grandmother writes a check to Billy Stevens. Endorse the check exactly as it has been written, but then add your own legal signature. We recommend that the restrictive endorsement be used in most cases. You may again want to add a line with your account number as shown there in the third example on page four. Finally, the full endorsement is used to transfer the check to another person or company. No one except the person or company stated on the endorsement can cash the check. Remember, to leave space for this other person or company to endorse the check when they deposit it into their account. Okay, so that's if you're transferring it to somebody else. Like if I want to write the check out to a friend of mine named Joe Smith, I would write pay to the order of Joe Smith and then I would sign my name. So now we're on page five, keeping checkbook records. Before we talk about writing checks, let's review keeping checkbook records. A primary requirement for managing your checking account is to keep good records. You should keep a record of every transaction that you make, including to whom the payment was made, the payee, who you're giving the money to, the purpose of the payment, the amount, the date of the payment, and the check number if the payment is via check. This is even more important than in the past since many banks no longer return images of the checks you have written and many payments don't actually involve paper checks. You also need to keep a record of every deposit you make, including the source of the deposit. The check register is the form most commonly used for recording banking activities. The banker will have given you a paper check register when you opened your account and you will receive additional registers when you order checks. You will probably also receive a plastic cover to hold both checks and the check register. The check register is laid out easily, out to easily record the information you need. The right columns keep a running balance of the amount of money available in your checking account. The illustration below shows how checkbook records are kept. Note that each transaction has two lines. The first line shows the payee, while the second line records the purpose of the check. 
This information is so important that you should fill out the register before you complete the transaction or even write the check. So you can see the example check there, the check to Midway Supermarkets completed except for the signature, okay? And then it's recorded down there. See a check entry? The number 60 is written in because that's the number 60 in the upper right corner of that check. The date matches the date on the check. Midway Supermarket matches the check. And it is a check, so it's $44.80, the same as on the check. And then you subtract the check from the balance of $160 to get $115.20. And then on the second line, you put for groceries so that you know. It might seem obvious, but um, in the future, you might not remember what that was for a month later. And so if you have a description there, it makes more sense. And you can see examples of a service charge entry, a deposit entry, online payment, ATM withdrawal, okay, that you want to refer back to this when we start the simulation. Note that every transaction has the same information. Online and pre-authorized payments may be identified as automatic clearinghouse, ACH, rather than a check number, okay? Um, writing checks. Finally, the good stuff, checks. May look a little scary at first, but a review of what is on them and how you should complete them should make you much more comfortable. Below is an autonomy of a check, pre-printed information, your name and address. This is not required, but it helps assure the payee that this is your account. For your own security, do not pre-print the information such as your social security number or your driver's license. Check number. Your checks will have sequential numbers printed on them in the upper right corner. The check number and the amount for which the check was drawn will appear on your monthly statement. The name of the payee and the purpose of the check will not appear on the bank statement. Bank name. The name of your bank. Fraction. This is a little routing number. Okay, um, that's not used. Usually it's in the lower left corner. We're going to skip that. And then number five, yep, the routing number and account number. This is important. The routing number identifies your financial institution and it is assigned by the American Banking Association. The account number identifies your account and is assigned by your bank. The routing number is always nine digits long and always appears between a vertical line and a colon and may appear before or after your account number. Some other symbols may also appear. This line is printed in a special font with magnetic ink so that they can be machine readable. Your check number will also appear in the same line and in the same font. The routing number and the account number are two items you will need to provide to set up direct deposits or prepaid payments or e-bills. If you make a mistake when writing a check, do not correct it. Print void in large letters across the front of the check and write another one. Save the voided check in your records. So uh, page seven, your entries. Date, this is the day you write your check. Unless otherwise noted on the check, the check will typically become non-negotiable six months after this date. Payee, the person or business to whom the check is written. Written amount, the amount of the check written in numbers with a decimal point separating dollars and cents. This should be written neatly and carefully to avoid misinterpretation. Look at the examples. Number nine, legal amount. The amount the check is written out for in words. If the legal amount and the written amount are different, the legal amount wins. But it is likely that the bank will not accept the check. How you fill out a check matters. Write clearly and neatly. Always use ink rather than pencil. Write your checks in a way that protects you from having the check altered. The written and legal amounts should be written starting at the left-hand side of the area allocated, and any extra space should be filled with a straight line. Start the legal amount with capital letters. And look at the examples there. Memo, simply a reminder of why you wrote the check. For recurring bills like rent or insurance, you should include the amount or quarter for which you're paying. And signature, your signature as you wrote it on the signature card. Without your signature, this is just a piece of paper. Sending an unsigned check to pay your credit card bill will result in both a late fee and possibly a hit to your credit rating.